como si nada. Y miren, para que les duela más, miren. Bellos los ojos de mi comandante, ¿verdad? Lloren, lloren, sigan ahí. Sigan ladrando. Porque si siguen ladrando es porque estamos cabalgando. Así dice Quijote, oye. Un beso. ¡Váyanse al carajo, yanquis de mierda! In the Sunshine State, that story ahead. Plus, could Nicolas Maduro's days as Venezuela's president be numbered? More on this developing story as CNN Newsroom continues. Welcome back to CNN Newsroom. I'm George Howell. In Venezuela, lawmakers say that they will push for impeachment proceedings against the president of that nation, Nicolas Maduro. The opposition-controlled National Assembly approved the measure on Sunday, declaring there has been a bound of constitutional order and a continued state of coup led by President Maduro. Violence also erupted during Sunday's special session of Congress. We get more now on this from CNN's Rafael Romo. The Venezuelan National Assembly was holding a special session Sunday with the purpose of finding a solution to the country's political crisis. Shortly after noon, a group of government supporters, some of them reportedly armed, stormed the assembly building after overwhelming security and breaking across barriers. Opposition legislators told CNN that some of the people who broke into the assembly meeting hall committed acts of vandalism. Others, the legislators said, stole cell phones from opposition lawmakers, throwing punches and pushing their way into the main floor while security guards unsuccessfully tried to stop them. Some journalists covering the meeting said their cameras and phones were also stolen. Pro-government legislators were finally able to convince the protesters to stop the attack and leave the building. The opposition is trying to find a way to oust President Nicolás Maduro as Venezuela continues to battle an economic crisis and massive shortages of food and medicine. Maduro refuses to hold a recall referendum on his presidency. His opponents say he has violated democracy in his own country. Twelve members of the Organization of American States, including the United States, signed a letter Friday calling for a dialogue to preserve peace in Venezuela. Rafael Romo, CNN Atlanta. Rafael, thank you. And in my program, I try to make it as much about the field as about the studio. We have to bring in all our great correspondents and their reports into this program so that that can be used as a bit of a starting block to interview the major world leaders. Really must be their first cycling president. But also people who are real experts, who are real players, people who've been there. So it's not just an interview program. It is about the storytelling and the reporting that I've done all that our colleagues continue to do. You take the risk even though you know a lot of people died. 20 years after the massacre here in Srebrenica, families of the victims are still looking for closure. I try to go several layers beneath the breaking news and try to really put it into context, to dig for understanding and meaning and solutions. Aman Paul, weeknights on CNN. Could this kind of thing happen in the US? Erin Burnett out front. Thursday on CNN. I'm David McKenzie on the Toby River in northern Botswana. This is CNN. Tonight, as ISIS tries to resist advancing liberation forces, we take a look inside America's largest forward base in Iraq. And we speak to Britain's Defense Minister, Michael Fallon. I saw much greater confidence when I visited Baghdad uh, about four weeks ago amongst the Iraqi military that uh, they are up for this operation. 
and Venezuela at breaking point, the opposition tells us they demand the government respect their legal right to recall the president. And we imagine the gender gap widening in the U.S. presidential election. everyone and welcome to the program. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. ISIS is feeling the heat and it is lashing out. As the Iraqi-led offensive bears down on Mosul, Daesh is desperately trying to slow down that advance with booby traps, suicide missions and blowing up a sulfur plant, igniting a toxic blaze. The UN says there are reports that ISIS has massacred dozens of people near Mosul. And our correspondents on the ground say that for the first time ever, ISIS is facing the resistance inside the city. Our Arwa Damon has the latest from the battlefield. This is Gayara West, America's largest forward position in Iraq, at the forefront of the battle for Mosul. From the moment you get a call, you can be mobile in this and out firing onto an enemy position within two minutes. Correct. Lieutenant Keegan Aldridge shows us the latest generation of precision artillery. So we are the furthest reaching um, artillery system on the battlefield, highly accurate and highly precise it's because our system minimizes the collateral damage, um, obviously because there's a lot of uh, urban targets uh, that we are prosecuting. This sprawling facility was a base during the U.S.-led occupation of Iraq. Some of the blast walls are from those days. When ISIS was finally driven out in August, they destroyed the runway. Mounds of earth hid bombs and buildings were booby-trapped. Now, the runway is clear and hundreds of troops are based here. Some sleep in tents, others in bunkers. And I see everyone has their gas masks. Yes. And we've needed them in the past couple of days. That's because of noxious smoke from a fire set by ISIS at a nearby sulfur plant which casts a dense pall over a huge area. Inside the Joint Operations Center, commanders closely watch drone feeds that we cannot film. Someone, someone's moving. It's like two squirters. Right now, a group of ISIS fighters is the target. Cheers erupt as they are hit. The fire support that we've been providing for this operation has been unprecedented. Since the Mosul liberation kicked off, we've dropped over 1,700 munitions. But if all goes according to plan, the operation will have to change. The civilian population does complicate the situation, and avoiding civilian casualties is a very high priority for a coalition, obviously. Um, so it will change the way that we look at, at our targeting. ISIS has long shown that it's a determined, cunning enemy. And the enemy always has a vote. I believe in what I've seen from our Iraqi and Peshmerga forces, the cooperation and the level of support that the coalition is providing, uh, I believe that uh, our vote will outweigh their vote. But what is a win in a country that has already lost so much? Arwa Damon, Siena, Gayara Air Base, Iraq. Now, NATO defense ministers say that the Iraqi offensive is going according to plan, and they say they're making serious moves to isolate Raqqa, which is the ISIS stronghold in Syria. The British Defense Secretary Michael Fallon joined me from the meeting in Paris earlier. Secretary Michael Fallon, welcome to the program. Can I start by asking you, you've said that you're pleased with progress so far in the battle for Mosul, so is the U.S. Defense Secretary, but what about the resistance? What about the booby traps, the suicide bombers? Tell us how stiff ISIS is fighting back. Well, we always expected resistance. This is one of uh, uh, ISIS Daesh's strongholds, Mosul and Raqqa over in Syria. We've seen the use of uh, ex improvised explosive devices in the cities that have been liberated uh, along the Euphrates River Valley. So it's no surprise to find them up the Tigris as well. Uh, they have to be dealt with. That's a big part of the British Army training that's uh, gone into the preparation of the Iraqi forces. But they are now making uh, 
significant progress up towards Mosul, particularly on the eastern bank of the Tigris. The RAF were in action all weekend. Some 50 targets were struck. And um, I'm confident that the encirclement of Mosul will soon be complete. Can I ask you, because Masoud Barzani, the president of Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, whose Peshmerga are obviously in the front line, he was a little bit uh, critical, shall we say, of the Iraqi forces, saying that it was the Peshmerga carrying the heaviest load. Are you convinced that the Iraqi forces are up to this job? Yes, I saw much greater confidence when I visited Baghdad uh, about four weeks ago amongst the Iraqi military, that uh, they are up for this operation. They know it's complex. Mosul is a very large city. But they have been fired up by the relative ease with which some cities along the Euphrates River Valley fell earlier this summer. And uh, I, did review the, the, I did review the Mosul plan with uh, President Barzani up in uh, Erbil. He knows the... Uh, Peshmerga, uh, you know, uh, have a key part to play on the eastern side uh, of Mosul. And there is an agreement between uh, Erbil and uh, Baghdad as to the respective parts these different units will play. And so far, it's holding. Mm -hmm. You're talking about agreements. I, I want to just jump forward to what seems to be a very difficult situation brewing for you and for Iraq and Turkey. Turkey insisting that it wants to get involved in this fight, Iraq saying no, and the prime minister suggesting that it could come to war between Iraq and Turkey if Turkey, quote unquote, invades. Well, I hope not. Uh, the prime minister obviously wants to see the integrity of Iraq uh, respected. And, uh, you know, we too don't want to see Turkey complicate what is already a pretty complicated situation up on the, the fault line, if you like, between Asia and, uh, and uh, Arabia, uh, particularly where you have uh, villages with uh, a high, high proportion of Turkmen living in them. So it's a complicated picture. But um, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that we will shortly see the encirclement of Mosul being completed and then the eventual, uh, um, the eventual assault on the city itself mm. to liberate the people there. And of course, there are, there are uh, Turkmen living inside uh, Mosul, so we have to recognize the complexity of this particular area. Indeed. It seems, though, from President Erdogan's vantage point, it's much more than about the Turkmen. It's about, it's about post-World War I borders and, and stopping the PKK. Are you confident that this NATO ally, this NATO partner of yours, will not intrude in Iraq unless invited or unless under a, an agreement by all of you? Well, the Turks are obviously concerned at what they've seen as some, uh, you know, extremist Kurdish elements. They've always been uh, concerned about that. Um, but we don't see the case for Turkey, for example, going any further south in Syria. Raqqa is essentially an Arab uh, city and will have to be liberated by an, an Arab force. And I hope the, you know, the Turks will understand that. And we look forward to discussing all this with our Turkish colleague when the NATO defense ministers meet uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Can I ask you about ISIS fighters retreating? Do you see them retreating to form a stand somewhere else and fight another day? I mean, we've just seen, and it's been claimed by ISIS, this massive attack in Pakistan uh, where they've killed more than 60 people at an academy. How worried are you that they are retreating with their weapons and to fight another day? Well, they're dangerous anyway. They're dangerous even before we've liberated Mosul and Raqqa. We've seen that in the attacks on Western Europe. Now, we don't know whether they're going to fight to the death in Mosul or whether they're going to melt away, as they did uh, from some of their earlier um, the cities that they'd previously captured along the Euphrates. Um, but obviously, one of the things we reviewed today is what we can do to better keep tabs on them, to share intelligence and where we can ensure that they are, um, you know, properly detained and where they've committed uh, crimes, that they are brought to justice in uh, whatever the jurisdiction is. And I guess finally, because you must all be trying to wrap your head around the day after Mosul is liberated, uh, President Barzani again said that he had seen no plan for a governing of Mosul. And I know that you're all in conversation about what should happen next. What will happen next? Do you have a plan? 
Yes, and I've seen the plans that the Iraqi authorities have for restoring order through the government of uh, Nineveh and the local administration there, and the United Nations, to which Britain has contributed uh, large sums of money and expertise. The United Nations has a plan for immediate relief in terms of providing uh, tangent accommodation, food, medical supplies for people who are displaced from Mosul as the fighting in the city itself uh, uh, begins. So a lot of planning has gone into what we call the day after. Obviously, it's a very large and complex city, so this isn't going to be an easy operation. But over the last few months, those plans have been put in place to try and deal as best we can with some of the humani inevitable humanitarian consequences. And we'll wait to see what happens with the governing and the political consequences. On that note, Defence Secretary Michael Fallon, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And coming up, a ticking time bomb of social unrest in Venezuela. Poverty on the streets and chaos in the government. I speak to the president of Venezuela's National Assembly. That's next. And connect with Latin America's driving evolution. Uniqueness, diversity, cutting-edge innovation. Here in Paraguay, we show you how Latin America is rising. The home to one of the largest hydroelectric dams in the world. And to a native plant that makes the increasingly popular sweetener, Stevia. A country proud of its Guaran culture, traditions and language. As discovered by going off the beaten path. Join us as we explore Paraguay. Latin America Rising, Friday on CNN. Welcome back to the program. With Venezuela at breaking point, the Vatican has now stepped in as both the government and the opposition agree to let the Holy See try to mediate their bitter political standoff. The streets have seen protests by supporters of President Nicolas Maduro in Caracas today as the opposition tries to oust him from office. In a moment, my interview with the opposition leader who heads the National Assembly. But first, Ordinary Venezuelans have also taken to the streets to protest critical shortages of food and medicine. And we get the lay of that land now from our Paula Newton, who's reported extensively from there since the crisis erupted. Paula, last time you were there, and you have seen this over and over again, it's really, really hard for people to just put food in their mouths, right? Absolutely. And the terrible, terrible scenes that we have seen, and believe me, it is starting now to hit every single solitary sector. So it doesn't matter if you were middle class, you are still hunting for food. And what does that mean? That means you line up for hours and hours and hours for food that you don't even know exists at the end of the line. And, and Christian, I'm talking basics, bread, flour, pasta, rice, these are very, very coveted goods right now and by everyone. The scene of desperation that we saw, Krishan, was the fact that people were bringing their families, bringing young children in the middle of the night to these lines, you know, taking their kids out of bed and taking them with them so that they could just line up for their children's breakfast or their children's next meal. And once again, Krishan, I will tell you, this is affecting almost every sector now, including people that thought themselves to be middle class. At least they weren't worrying about where the next meal was going to come from. And obviously we know that people have been going into next door Colombia to try to get food and medicine. Uh, tell us about the hospitals as well. The hospital situation is beyond shocking and it's very difficult, Krishan, when you speak to the parents. And we're talking about parents who can't get cancer care for their children, who cannot get dialysis care for their children. Human Rights Watch now says that infant mortality could be up as much as 50 percent in the last three years. This is a real impact. And I think some of the political efforts now, Krishan, that you are seeing behind the scenes are an effort to try and depoliticize at least the human rights situation because as you can see from the pictures it is appalling conditions in hospitals not to mention the fact that when you go to these places you really live in fear now a lot of the hospitals are also crime ridden we spoke to people who had medicine taken right out of their beds the antibiotics that they had at their bedside table and the desperation continues every single solitary day and that's why many people are calling on the government to instead of denying that there's a human humanitarian crisis to, to just do something to resolve it well do something to resolve it means trying according to the opposition to recall the president and they have used all legal measures to try to do that and that's been sort of slapped down by all the levers of power that the president controls 
you know, I'm soon we're just going to have our interview in a second. But from your perspective, the political standoff, how can that be resolved? It is very difficult to be resolved because not only is, you know, the opposition fighting against the government, but there are factions within the government and within the opposition that do not agree with each other. And we see a lot of, of these divisions. I'll tell you, Christian, what those mothers told me in the hospital. We don't care. We need medicine. We need food. We need it now. And we want our political leaders to come together to just do something to alleviate the crisis right now, which is why you see people like former prime ministers, getting into the fray right now, getting to hopefully what are some negotiations upcoming to just at least try and get some humanitarian aid into that country. But that is going to mean that President Maduro has to go to the table and actually say, yes, I realize that there's a problem and I will do my best to get more food and medicine to the people who mm -hmm. need it. And it's a dramatic situation in one of Latin America's richest countries, after all. Paula, thank you so much. And as I mentioned earlier today, I did speak with one of Venezuela's top opposition figures, Henry Ramos Ayub. He's the president of Venezuela's National Assembly, and he warns the government will do all it can to stay in power. Mr. Ramos Ayub, welcome to our program. Muchas gracias. Do you accept that the Vatican will be able to mediate your crisis with the government? All sides have agreed to let the Vatican try. Yes, of course. We ourselves, from the table of the democratic unity, we have solicited the help of the Vatican to be able to help out in the mediation between the government. What do you expect the end game to be? Because it looks like the government has trapped the opposition in a dead end. It has used legal measures to defy your use of the Constitution. Uh... The government is doing whatever possible to stay in power by violating the Constitution, and the opposition is insisting in terms of exercising the constitutional rights to revoke the power of the president because it is within the Constitution. The executive power controls completely the Supreme Court and also the Electoral College. And from there, they are violating systematically the Constitution Constitution, and they have also tried to annul all of the constitutional powers which the assembly, which the National Assembly has, and uh, whose right it is past December, which gave the opposition an overwhelming majority within the assembly. Is your country at breaking point? We see protests in the street. We see even protests in Parliament. It's a very unusual situation. We also know that the vast majority wanted a recall referendum, and that is being denied them. How explosive is the situation? Because people are talking about civil war in Venezuela. Is that possible? No, I don't think there is a civil war, but evidently... I don't think there'll be a civil war, but evidently that, that there has been uh, the possibility that there are going to be many protests and uh, uh, social explosions, not only because of the political situation, but because of the economical situation and for the lack of food, the lack of medicine, because of the lack of proper uh, social services. This is one of the countries, particularly Caracas, one of the cities that is uh, the most dangerous do you really believe that you will be able to pursue impeachment against the president? Impeachment. Impeachment, impeachment. impeachment can be translated or can be translated as a political trial or a political evaluation of the president. Precisely, that is what's going to be initiated today in our in today's assembly. The possibility to determine the political responsibilities of the president of the republic, because according to the constitution and the law of Venezuela, the responsive the administrative responsibility is uh, controlled by the assembly and the. Uh, and it will be determined by the courts of law, but in terms of the concrete situation is a process that will be initiated today in the assembly to determine exactly what his responsibilities should be. You are president of the National Assembly. The opposition controls the National Assembly. But what are the chances of that actually happening if President Maduro has all the other organs of state at his disposal? 
En lo que se refiere a la Asamblea Nacional... In terms of what is referred to the National Assembly, there is a very real possibility because we have the control of the National Assembly and we are exercising that control according to the Constitution. But since the Supreme Court is politically controlled by the President and is using it as an instrument to be able to violate the Constitution against the Assembly, uh, surely the fail of using the Supreme court to fulfill the needs of the constitution will not proceed to destitute the president of its power. Mr. Ayub, people are saying that you are at a crossroads right now, either to send your people into the streets to, to make their demands or be able to unite all of Venezuelan society to accomplish your demands. Which one will it be? It's completely legitimate that we use the protests on the streets, that we give uh, or we ex exercise the popular pressure to demand of the government to comply by the Constitution and to be able to revoke him of his powers. That's where we're standing right now in Venezuela. Henry Ramos Ayub, President of the Venezuelan National Assembly, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Muchas gracias a ustedes por la entrevista. Thank you all very much for the interview. And we have asked repeatedly for a Venezuelan government representative to appear on our program. So far, they've declined. When we come back, we imagine a world where women at the top have had it up to here. He thinks that because he has a mouth full of Tic Tacs, that he can force himself on any woman within groping distance. <laughs> For you, Donald Trump, women have had it with guys like you. U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren strikes a nerve as a gender tipping point appears to be growing in the U.S. election. What women leaders around the world are saying about their struggle with sexism. That's next. CNN Newsroom live from Los Angeles. Ahead this hour, the battle for Mosul will take you inside an American air base, which is bringing precision firepower to the fight against ISIS. Less than two weeks until the U.S. presidential election, Donald Trump gets new ammunition against Hillary Clinton. In Russia's online war, a former internet troll shows us what a Kremlin-funded propaganda machine looks like. Hello and welcome to our viewers around the world. I'm Aisha Sasei. Great to have you with us. I'm John Fors. We're into the third hour of Newsroom L.A. Iraqi-led battle for Mosul advances ahead of schedule. Western defense ministers are moving forward with plans to fight ISIS on another front. At a meeting in Paris, they discussed taking the terror group's stronghold in Syria. The U.S. Defense Secretary says the battles for Mosul and Raqqa will overlap. And there is word now of clashes inside Mosul between ISIS and resistance fighters. Michael Holmes is near the Mosul front lines. He joins us now live. Uh, so, uh, Michael, what's the update there this morning uh, as the offensive continues, as these forces move towards Mosul? Exactly what are they facing uh, as they try to move closer to the city? Yeah, we're, we're near the uh, town of Bashika, a strategically important town. It's on a, a main uh, supply route for ISIS into Mosul. Uh, a couple of days ago, Kurdish Peshmerga forces surrounded the town, and in fact, uh, more than that, uh, the surrounding villages, about half a dozen or so of those, actually just literally uh, had uh, word from the front uh, down in the town, and they're telling us that they have now cleared most of those villages. There has been fighting this morning. We've heard it from here. Uh, there was uh, pre-dawn aerial bombardments, 500-pound bombs being dropped, and uh, we've also heard some uh, outgoing artillery from around our position here and small arms fire. Uh, eight ISIS fighters killed this morning in one of those villages. We just literally heard that from somebody uh, at the front line down there on the, uh, in the fighting force. So when they get Bashika here, the town itself, the resistance they're finding has been so far, uh, it has been, 
it has been fierce at times, but it hasn't been constant. The one thing that uh, pushed Peshmerga forces back uh, from the outskirts of Bashika was a suicide vehicle bombs and also sniper positions, and that's probably what those large aerial bombardments uh, were about earlier today, softening it up. So the advance is being made. Uh, El but if all goes according to plan, the operation will have to change. The civilian population does complicate the situation, and avoiding civilian casualties is a very high priority for the coalition, obviously. Um, so it will change the way that we look at, at our targeting. ISIS has long shown that it's a determined, cunning enemy. And the enemy always has a vote. I believe in what I've seen from our Iraqi and Peshmerga forces, the cooperation and the level of support that the coalition is providing. Uh, I believe that uh, our vote will outweigh their vote. But what is a win in a country that has already lost so much? Arwa Damon, CNN, Gayara Air Base, Iraq. Well, Donald Trump is making a bleak prediction if Hillary Clinton wins the White House. He says her aggressive approach to Syria will lead to all-out war between the U.S. and Russia. What we should do is focus on ISIS. We should not be focusing on Syria. Well, and you, and then you'll end up with her plan. You'll end up in World War III with Syria. You're going you're gonna to end up, Steve. You're going to end up in World War III over Syria if we listen to Hillary Clinton. She's incompetent. Earlier in the day, Trump took aim at Obamacare, which he has vowed to repeal and replace new government figures. So, Pierre Tandon expressing outrage at Cheryl Mills, Clinton's chief of staff as Secretary of State, who helped sign off on the email arrangement. Tandon wrote Podesta, why didn't they get this stuff out like 18 months ago? So crazy. Unbelievable, Podesta replied. They wanted to get away with it, Tandon shot back. Now, Clinton won the support today from former Secretary of State Colin Powell, a longtime Republican who says he is voting for her in November. Of course, he did support President Obama in 2008 and 2012 as well. He said he simply does not recognize the Republican Party. But Hillary Clinton is counting on Democrats to put her over the top. It's why she's here in South Florida, a key Democratic bastion. She's also attending her last fundraiser of the campaign. By our count, she's had 371. Jeff Zeleny, CNN, Coconut Creek, Florida. A new CNN OLC poll shows most Americans believe Hillary Clinton is headed for victory. 68% of those surveyed believe Clinton will win. 27% say they think Trump will win, and that obviously includes Donald Trump. But only 35% say Trump will accept the result and concede if he loses. 61% say he will not. Okay, a short break. When we come back, newly released recordings reveal Trump's obsession with winning. What the Republican says about his love for fighting, hatred of losing, and refusal to accept failure. But first, the Philippine president reignites his war of words with the U.S. on his visit to Japan. The old grudges he's bringing up, I'll bring all them all to you next. Now, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte will meet with Japan's Prime Minister in the coming hours. And Mr. Duterte is rehashing some bad blood with the U.S. during his visit to Tokyo. CNN's Will Ripley joins us now. And Will, even before President Duterte got on the four-hour flight to Tokyo, he had uh, stepped up his war of words with the U.S., calling Americans foolish and a land full of pure bigotry and discrimination. Talk to us about what's happening now that he's landed in Tokyo and how much this war of words with the U.S. is overshadowing his visit to Japan. Well, certainly we believe that members of his inner circle have been advising President Duterte to avoid this really hostile anti-U.S. rhetoric. It's very clear and people close to him confirmed that he has had a deep grudge against the United States for some time. There was an incident where he was denied a visa. He's very sensitive to criticism over his human rights records pertaining to his war on drugs uh, in Davao City when he was mayor and now nationwide in the Philippines where just in four months several thousand people have died in these so-called extrajudicial killings. These are suspect deaths without trial either shot by police or other drug suspects. Here in Japan, so far at least, Duterte has toned down this rhetoric, probably at the advice of people, including his chief economist, who I interviewed uh, yesterday, uh, just hours after the, the delegation arrived here. He tried to clarify what Duterte is trying to accomplish when he talks about distance and separation from the United States. It's uh, all rhetoric, really. Uh, in reality, 
what we, what we are really going to do is just to uh, rebalance rebalance the economy from too much dependence on uh, the U.S. In a speech uh, within the last few hours here in Tokyo, President Duterte did, however, talk about uh, that economic rebalancing, also moving towards the eventual removal of U.S. military and all foreign troops in the Philippines, uh, which would basically undo a longstanding treaty agreement with the United States. Just over an hour from now, Aisha, he will meet with the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Of course, uh, uh, Abe is a close ally of President Obama. The two are expected to have a bilateral meeting and then issue a joint press statement. We are not sure, and perhaps it's probably unlikely, that there will be a press conference simply because it is in those question and answers uh, periods where often what Duterte says is quite unpredictable, and Abe's people wouldn't want the optics of having him stand by side with somebody who could start ranting about uh, the United States in a derogatory and coarse way. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Ripley, joining us there from Tokyo, Japan, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Well, State of the Race with Kate Baldwin is coming up next for our viewers in Asia. And for everyone else here on Newsroom LA, we'll take a short break. When we come back, as the U.S. calls out the Kremlin for state-sponsored hacking, a former internet troll tells CNN how Russia is influencing political opinions online. Plus this. It's very, very difficult for many of our older people who live in this community. What on earth is going to happen to them? What is going to happen to them? People who live near... Months. Aaron McLaughlin, CNN, Harmonsworth, UK. Well, to Venezuela now, where a nationwide protest is planned against the president for Wednesday. The country's opposition led National Assembly demanded Nicolas Maduro appear next week, what members call a political and criminal trial. The opposition accuses him of moving towards dictatorship after a referendum to force him from office was suspended. Mr. Maduro was elected after Hugo Chavez died three years ago. The country is in its third year of recession. People are dealing with food and medicine shortages and skyrocketing inflation. A short break. When we come back, we'll get inside Donald Trump's mind. We'll find out what newly released tapes and how they show a defiant billionaire eager to fight. Russia had its own pussy riot moment. What do you think of Donald Trump's pussy riot moment? Well, um, I don't know whether this would... I, English is not my mother tongue. I don't know whether I would be... I, I would sound, uh, I mean, um, decent. Um, there are so many pussies around your presidential campaign on both sides that I prefer not to comment about this. We got white pussy, black pussy, Spanish pussy, yellow pussy, we got hot pussy, cold pussy, we got wet pussy, we got smelly pussy, we got hairy pussy, bloody pussy, we got snapping pussy, we got silk pussy, velvet pussy, nalga hide pussy, we even got horse pussy, dog pussy, chicken pussy, come on, you want pussy, come on in pussy lovers, if we don't got it, you don't want it, come on in Oh my goodness, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> ¡Vaya al carajo! ¡Yankee de mierda!